Hey church family, I'm happy to be with you, sharing with you a lesson from the protest of the princes, chapter 11, Great Controversy, from my home, kind of cool. And I am, this is an interesting chapter because it does two things for us I want to spend some time on. Number one, it reminds us the value of religious freedom, what that means. So, um... And it really challenges the the concept of the of the Catholics claim on authority. So here's the here's the background. The protest of the princes is when the princes of Germany took a stand. Catholic Church and the Charles V, the Habsburg dynasty, worked together and they thought they had pressured everybody, but suddenly this significant group of German princes stood up and said, we want to decide in our own area what we worship. We don't want you guys dictating our, our beliefs. And it was a real touch and go moment where they, it really decided whether or not the Protestant Reformation succeeded or failed. And it was so significant that that's where we get our name, Protestant. We, we protest we protested and so what I want to do again right now is I want to talk about um, how the principles of Protestant have bettered the world and then I want to go back and look at um, again how the challenge to the Catholic Church authority was was key in helping Protestants become the people that better the world okay so let's try this Um, First of all, the principles of Protestantism is the Bible alone, not tradition, as the authority of our faith and lives. Secondly, salvation by grace alone through faith. And lastly, priesthood of all believers. Now, I want you to think for a moment. The Catholic Church claimed the authority of the Apostle Peter handed down to them through succeeding popes. They claimed that they had oral tradition given them by the apostles. Things like veneration of saints, confession of sins to priests, purgatory, Sunday, sacredness, and uh, see, um, these these were all uh, things that they claimed, but They don't have any authority in the Bible. There's no scriptural basis for them. This is just things that they they got down. And they take some scriptures where Paul says, hey, I I wasn't able to write everything down, but keep hold sacred what I told you. And they said, ah, see, Paul said things he didn't write down. And and these are that. And we go, well, that's not good enough for us Protestants. (laughs) Why? Because here's why. Because whenever you become a spiritual monopoly and you crush all the competition, your priests get lazy abuses abound and the people receive incredibly poor spiritual truth and support in fact one of the you know a lot of times catholics will look at protestants and they say you know you guys claim you're following the bible but look at all the different churches you're a mess but that's actually our strength is that we allow spiritual competition now in some ways protestants like whenever protestants get in charge they kind of become the powerhouse. They become a new monopoly, and they kind of tend to squash competition. I mean, Oliver Cromwell did that in Britain. Um, the Puritans and Pilgrims did that when they got to Massachusetts. That's why Roger Williams had to create Rhode Island and run over and, and allow the minorities to worship the way they wanted. And uh, it's true. Like whoever gets in charge, they were once the minority. They get in charge. They kind of want to crush the competition, but. Um, that's not good. It's not good. In fact, it's kind of interesting is um, one of the reasons I think um, America and France went separate ways spiritually. They both revolted and rebelled against the crown. But the, the, the France in the revolution went a little bit further and they rebelled against the Catholic tradition, the Catholic faith. And whereas Americans didn't, they stayed very spiritual, very religious. We had incredible religious innovations 
in plurality in the 1800s, a lot of, in fact, that's where Seventh-day Adventists started. We started in the 1800s. So what was the difference? Well, here's the difference. The French traded the monopoly of the Catholic Church for the monopoly of atheism. And what happens when you have a monopoly? Continued abuse, continued um, control. You have lazy leaders. I mean, if, if you're the only game in town, why do you need to be better at it? Because no, no, no one can go anywhere else. You have a terrible, terrible service. And whereas America, America went a different route. And they said, basically, we're not going to get involved. We're not going to, as a state, we're not going to determine who wins and who loses religiously. We're going to let people decide for themselves. And what happens when you have people decide for themselves? Spiritual things, it means more to them. When you choose your own faith, it means more to you. You live up to it more. It was a brilliant way. And we really have Roger Williams to thank for that. He really took religious freedom um, above and beyond what most Protestant groups did. Now, let's go back here and talk about, um, for, um, for a moment, how the Protestant faith, um, the doctrines that it believes, how it bettered those countries versus Catholic. Well, first of all, we talked about how, uh, we talked about monopolies, but let's go a little bit further. Um, they did a study a little while ago on the differences between countries that were um, founded by, or not founded, but were sent missionaries by Protestants versus Catholics. So a lot of these countries, you know, in Africa, South America, and America, um, and other places, you know, uh, Australia, um, India, um, some of them had a lot of Catholic missionaries, some of them had Protestant missionaries. And what's the difference 200 years later? Well, here's the difference. The Protestant countries had better literacy, greater democracy, more economic development. They were much more uh, sensitive to rights. Women had rights and children had rights. And you ask, well, why? Well, here's why. Because the principles of Protestantism says that you are special. Just you, the priesthood of all believers levels the field. Not just priests who, who serve the mass. No, they're not any better than you are. What really matters is you have a personal walk with God. You may have inherited the position of king. Doesn't matter. What's your walk with Jesus like? Well, anybody can have a walk with Jesus. Not everybody can have the right parents to, to be royalty. So it really leveled the field and it said everybody's important. And everybody has a personal walk with Jesus and that's what determines their eternal life. Not whether or not they've done enough, they, they've accessed the right pilgrimages and the indulgences and the masses at, you know, at their funerals. Like, that doesn't matter. What matters is your personal walk with Jesus and how you how you handle the word of God and how you let it affect your life. Well, I'm telling you, like, that makes a better citizen. And it makes, um, it really paves the way for democracy. And democracy is about the, the, the flourishing competition of great ideas. And when you have the best ideas happen, then your country becomes a better country. Um, like, for example, um, if you, well, let me give you this example. Um, when, the, when the Protestants, when the Germans became Protestants and the English became Protestants, and they no longer believed that their salvation was enhanced by all these masses said at their funerals, that they couldn't lessen the number of years they spent in purgatory by paying the Catholic Church to save these masses for them, then what do they do with all that money that they accrued in their lifetime? Well, they give it to their children. Well, in Protestant countries, suddenly you had people inheriting money from their parents, which along with the doctrine of work hard, make the, you know, Martin Luther told his people, make the best shoe for the best price. Like that's your spiritual obligation. That's how you bless the world. Have a great business that's honest and fair. Like that in combination with money, 
created an incredible powerhouse of economic development. That's why a lot of the Protestant countries were, um, were great colonizers and uh, they had the money to do it. And it was, it was the change of this belief. And the Catholic Church wasn't the only spiritual shop in town by where you could get salvation. And so this is a this is a, a an incredible benefit of Protestantism, in in that it allowed companies to flourish. Now, when you have a monopoly, a spiritual monopoly, it often can only be supported by having a heavy reliance on the state to suppress all competition, and we call this spiritual religious persecution. So in the Catholic churches, they tended to have a, a civil leader, very powerful, who would, who would suppress any competition in the Catholic church. And why was that important to some of these uh, civil leaders? Because the, the priesthood would validate their reign. And that made it easier for them to rule when people believed that God had ordained them to be rulers. And so it was a kickback. They supported the Catholic Church who supported them. And what it did is it allowed them to lead the way they wanted to lead. And what happens when you don't have competition? You, you benefit yourself. And so you had the rich rise and you had the, everybody else becoming poor. And so you had a real disparity between the poor and the rich. Well, the, the Catholic Church would get money from the rich and then give a third of it to the poor people. And so the poor people kind of thought the Catholic Church was great, and so they needed the Catholic Church, and it was really, it kind of kept them in this cycle. Um, and so when Protestants came along and, um, and opened it up and said, you know, we all need to study the Bible, so now you had all these people competing and saying, no, here's how you look at the Bible, and, and here's how we should live life, and here's how we should do government. And guess what happens? Like, after a while, the best ideas emerge. And... And everybody tries something different. And after a while, you can look and see whose idea is working the best. And by the way, this is what we as Seventh-day Adventists do. Like we sit down when we study the Bible with people and we say, have you ever wondered why there are so many churches when they all claim to be following the Bible? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of different denominations out there. Um, and then what do we as Seventh-day Adventists do? We say, well, we're the right one. And if you don't, agree with us, we're going to get the sheriff in town to come and smack you with the side of the head. No, we don't say that. We don't say that. Why? No, what we say is, we say, listen, here's the reasons why. Take a look at the Bible. Commandments of God. Faith of Jesus. Like, you know, we show them the scriptures. And by spiritual insight in the Holy Spirit and by reason, we hope to convince them to see that our faith is legitimately founded on the Word of God. And I tell you, this has been so powerful for us Seventh-day Adventists because in the 1800s, let me tell you, there were a lot, a lot of different spiritual ideas floating out there. And even in Adventism itself, after um, the Great Disappointment in 1844, Adventism was mainly first-day Adventist. And... Then there was a split between those who didn't believe in the state of the dead as we, you know, you went straight to heaven, some believe you stayed in the ground. Well, it was this small little group of 50 Seventh-day Adventists, the original 50 Seventh-day Adventists, who really studied the Bible, and they believed in the Saturday Sabbath, and they believed in the sanctuary, and they believed in the third angel's message, and this developed them into the powerhouse that we are. 15 million, I think, I think first-day Adventists, there's like only 100,000. I remember, I remember canvassing in, in uh, Santa Cruz and I was walking through a neighborhood and I came on this little tiny country church and I knocked on the door and they and um, didn't realize it was a church. And then when I opened it, I stepped in the door. It was this picture of William Miller. And I was like, oh, you guys, like, are you Seventh-day Adventists? And they're like, no, 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 we're First-day Adventists. Like, we're descended from William Miller, but we don't keep, we're not, we're not, we don't keep Saturday Sabbath. And uh, so I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know they existed and, um, until I met them. But what again, what it shows is they were strong. I mean, they had like 100,000, I think, originally. And we had 50 people, but now we have 15 million or, and you know, they're way down. Um, and the guy even told me, he says, yeah, we're dying out. We're not gonna be here after this generation. We're gonna be gone. 
And again, what is it? It just says that um, the principles of Protestant Reformation, that, that you have an individual walk with God, it, it levels the playing field, and it makes everybody spiritually search, and the best spiritual insights emerge. And as people wrestle with that and they, and they choose and pick, then you have opportunity to see what works and what doesn't. And I think that's in some ways um, challenging for us Seventh-day Adventists because sometimes um, we do have to innovate a little bit more than we typically want to. And we have to think, you know, how do we make our faith more relevant? We can't just claim tradition. Um, it has always been that way. Sometimes we have to be a little flexible and yet stay true to what makes us who we are. But I really, um, I think what I want you to walk away with um, from this time together is that the Protestant Reformation was founded on a challenge to the Catholic Church that enabled a lot of competition spiritually, which was a good thing. And I think that we all, um, I guess I'll end it with this. You know, I think that sometimes I think, you know, we'll see evangelical churches out there who really have an itching desire to coerce uh, the state to to enforce um, some of their um, ways of life. And, and I think that's dangerous. And I think, you know, um, it's great to you know, want a moral uh, moral society and and um, it's based on, on biblical values, but it can never be done by coercion. And every Protestant group, when Lutherans got big, they decided to crush the competitions and the pilgrims, and we can't do that. And I think um, we always need to remember religious liberty in this time and age is still true. You can't have a monopoly. May the best church win. May the best church who, who follows the scripture and, and has a connection with the Holy Spirit like that's what makes us the best and that's what we gotta stick to. And that's what we wanna do. Lord bless you and uh, we'll see you in a few days.